All right, hi everybody, and uh, thanks for coming. So, for people who don't know who I am, I run a game studio called uh, Shell Games, and I also teach at uh, the Entertainment Technology Center at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I used to be at Disney at the uh, virtual reality studio there, and I wrote a book called The Art of Game Design. So, today we're going to talk about future of storytelling. Now, some of you younger people, uh, younger game developers may not be aware that the company you know as EA used to be called Electronic Arts. <laughs> it is said they changed the name when the irony became too much for them to bear. Um, they were a very different company when they were young. They were a company that really, really was focused on how do you create great, deep, meaningful experiences. And they would talk a lot about how are we going to create the future of storytelling. And one of the phrases that came up often was how, what would it take to create a game that would make people cry? They would, they would talk about uh, questions like this. And that was a long time ago. We're talking about 30 years ago. And how are we doing in terms of our incredible, epic, great storytelling? I think there's been some progress, but still, I, I don't think the world takes us very seriously. Not seriously like they take the stage and great immortal stories on the stage. Shakespeare stories are incredible. They're, we like them so well that even though the language has moved on, we still tell them the same way because we're afraid to touch it. Literature, certainly. We, we know that there are great, great, amazing novels. And even film has, there are things in film that people say that is a great story. That is truly epic, classic storytelling that, that may last hundreds of years. And how are we doing in games? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of these things is not like the other, unfortunately, right? You know, so where, what, are we going to have a Shakespeare of games? Are we going to have games that are like, this game was told so perfectly and so well that 200 years from now, when people play it, they need to play it exactly as it was. Is that going to happen? Is that a thing? Or is that just not possible with our medium? There are weaknesses that our medium has, and we need to face up to those, because if we're going to get better at this, we're going to have to confront them. One of them is a problem of verbs. So right now, we have video game verbs. They tend to be things like running and shooting and jumping and climbing and throwing and punching. You watch a movie, it's a different story. There's a lot of verbs there that are different, talking and negotiating and arguing and pleading and complaining. And you'll notice the difference here is a difference that is, goes there. Uh, movie verbs are up here, and a lot of the video game verbs are just down here. We're really good at the below the neck verbs. We got those. It's the above the neck verbs that we are missing. And can we get those into our games? If we can find ways to get those, it's going to make a big difference. So that's the first problem. Second problem, people talk about theater, they talk about comedy and tragedy. You know what we suck at? Tragedy. It's not really a thing for us. If we're doing interactive Romeo and Juliet, what happens? Oh my god, she died. Well, let me go back to the checkpoint. We're going to fix that up. <laughs> there we go. Straightened out. Go us, right? Um, I'm not saying doing tragedy is impossible in video games. It's just hard. And does everything have to be tragedy? No. But it is interesting to think about when people look at the greatest stories of all time, they often point to tragedies and say, yes. This is a truly great story, and it would be sad if that, if that area of greatness was, was off limits to us. So a third problem is this problem of, of unification, of wholeness, of unity. All great stories, the ending is foreordained by the beginning. When Cinderella is all filthy in the fireplace, like sh there is no option for this story other than for her to become the, the princess at the end. This story makes no sense if she's like, forget you, stepmother, and gets a job as a waitress around the corner in her own little apartment and lives kind of mediocrely ever after. No, that sucks. That's a lousy story. That story, like the first five seconds of the story, determine the ending. And when you have interactive stories, can we really have that and still have greatness? That may be our biggest challenge of all that we have to confront. I don't know if people have seen this movie. 
This is an incredible movie, Hamlet 2. And I'm going to show you a clip from it because I think this clip, better than anything else, summarizes the way the great storytellers of the world look at video game storytellers. So in, uh, just to set this up, uh, the guy who uh, uh, runs this uh, drama club at school has gotten complaints from parents who are pulling their kids out of the play, and he goes to visit one of the, the parents, goes to visit the parents of one of the kids. Yes, our concerns about the play are of a different nature. If it's the sex and violence, I can totally tone that down. No, we're fine with those. Then what is it? We merely expressed our absolute distaste for a sequel to what is arguably the greatest play in the English language. Not to mention the quality of the writing, which is uh, quite low. <laughs> well, no offense, but uh, what the hockey puck do you know? Well, I've... Uh, I've published nine novels. I have a PhD in literature. My wife is a painter. She currently has an exhibit at the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> then, help me fix my play. I'm trying to save drama. You have Hamlet using a time machine to stop Gertrude from drinking the poison, to stop Ophelia from drowning. You're taking the tragedy out of the tragedy. I just wondered why in Hamlet 1, everybody has to die. It's such a downer. I mean, if Hamlet had had just a little bit of therapy, he could have turned everything around. Everybody deserves a second chance. Yeah. And I think mostly we look like that, right? Because that's what we do. We take... We, we, we create ridiculous stories with zombies and monsters and time machines, and, there's, and we always set it up so that no matter what, there's going to be a happy ending. And it, 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 it's a challenge for us. So as we break this down, one of the things I often talk about is this notion of the elemental tetrad, that all games have uh, four components. Obviously, we're talking about story here. And we, it's, I'm not saying, hey, is it, are we challenged by making great games? Of course we make great games. There are great games. There have been great games for thousands of years. And we're going to continue to make great games. I'm specifically focusing on the question of, is it possible for games to have truly great world-class story in, enmeshed in them? And we've had some good ones, but I don't think we've had anything immortal yet. And so if it can come, it's going to come because our medium is going to change in some way. And I think it probably won't be because of the changes in aesthetics. I think it's going to be either changes in mechanics or changes in technology. And then the question remains, which one is it? Do we have to wait around for technology to get better before we can have great stories? Or could it be there's just some simple game mechanics we haven't thought of that will help enable the infusion of great stories? I think there are arguments for mechanics. Phoenix Wright is a fascinating game. The stories are interesting and engaging. And it's not like we haven't had crime drama games before. We've had them since the early 80s. They just were never very good. And it was a clever mechanic that they figured out in Phoenix Wright. They figured out a kind of a time travel mechanic. When you were doing the interrogation, normally dialogue happens in a linear fashion. Because in the real world, dialogue happens in a linear fashion. But in Phoenix Wright, the, the, the testimony is laid out for you. And you can scrub over it and go to any point and dig in and say, wait a minute, I see a contradiction here. And when you nail that contradiction, suddenly the testimony changes. Like, that doesn't happen in the real world, but it happens here, and it makes for a great game. Someone could have thought of this mechanic at Infocom in 1982, and it would have been fine. It would have been great, but nobody thought of it. It may be there are more mechanics like this that will lead to better and great storytelling. Another one along this line is the invention of Dungeons & Dragons in 1974. This game could have been invented 1,000 years ago. The ancient Greeks could have invented this game. They had 20-sided dice. I have seen them. Right? But they didn't. It didn't show up until 1974. No one thought to make a story game quite this way, somehow. And I always wondered, what was it about 1974 that made people think of it? The weird part is I figured it out. 1972, Hunt the Wumpus showed up in college campuses all across the country. And here was the first dungeon crawl adventure 
where you could go and explore a, a dungeon in a single player game. No one had done this before. It was a week and it was thin, but it was a beginning and it made people say, oh my God, this is great. What if this game was actually good? What if a, what if a human being took the place of the computer? And I think that has to be what inspired it, because otherwise this coincidence is insane. And so here you have the case of a, a game mechanic that was ins inspired by uh, technology, which is, which is interesting. Chris Swain from USC has an incredible prophecy about what will happen in the 21st century with games. He argues that film was not taken seriously as a medium until it learned to talk. It, when it was a silent medium, it was, ah, it's kind of for kids, it's kind of silly, we don't take it seriously, the stories aren't that great. But once it learned to talk, it became the literature of the 20th century, is the phrase that he uses. Well, what are games waiting for? They can already talk. We hear them talk all the time. And he argues, no, they're waiting on something else. They are waiting to learn to listen. And that once games learn to listen and have a conversation with the player, that they will become the literature of the 21st century, is his argument. And I suspect this may be dead on right, that if, if we're going to have our Shakespeare of games, it's going to show up this way. So let's talk about some of the things that are standing on our way. One of them is sensing emotion. This is coming. Here, take a look at this. Using a program called Face API, it's possible to track a person's facial features using nothing more than a standard web camera. In turn, we can use this information to drive the expression of a virtual character, such as Breen here, taken from the game Half-Life 2. This technology could allow players to accurately portray themselves online for use in multiplayer games or socialising applications. If you're interested in learning more about this technology or other related work I've done, please check out my website. Okay, so puppeteering, that's cool. Could be great for MMOs, could be great for great social experiences, but this same technology is what will make it possible for a character to tell when you're surprised, when you're yelling, when you're smiling, when you're frowning, when you're frustrated. We will be able to read that in a relatively short time, probably within 10 years. This will be something that will be a normal part of, of gameplay. So that's one. So now the next one is words. Now, words aren't new. Here we got, hey, you, Pikachu. What was this, 1996, I think. P you could talk to Pikachu and give him commands. It was perfect, because Pikachu's a disobedient little cuss. And so <laughs> the fact that technology only worked 20% of the time actually was in character for him. <laughs> but now, you know, we've got, we've got Siri here. I'll do some Siri right here, right? Let's, let's, let's check it out here, if I can do it right. Merry Christmas, Siri. Wait. Christmas isn't today. It's on December 25th. Right? Like, <laughs> all right? So Siri knows what's going on, right? Understood me, no training, and like kind of formulated in a semi-intelligent response. We are just at the cusp where this is going to start to be a useful way to interact with games. But of course, words aren't enough. We actually have to have meaningful understanding. It's sort of cool that Siri understood that, but someone must have custom programmed that. And people say, oh my god, it's such an impossible problem. We're never going to get there. There have been people working on this for 30, 40 years, and it's piling up. It's, gonna, it's piling up, and it's going to get to a point where suddenly we're going to have systems that start to work. And there's a picture of Alan Turing. People talk about the Turing test. Oh, it'll be so hard. For, it's no good unless it can really replicate a human. Really, like, have you ever seen C-3PO or Data on Star Trek? They would not pass the Turing test, but it would be awesome to have a conversation with them. It's okay to have characters that are intelligent, but not all the way there. Even just a dog that, be that would behave intelligently would be exciting. Text adventures, what the heck happened? This was gonna be it. This was the combination of novels and games. The thing that was missing from text adventures that nobody talks about, the reason I think the medium went away, it's not just because graphics are cool, right? Books didn't go away when television showed up. They're still here. Um, the reason is that text adventures present a sort of a lie. That prompt there says, type anything. And there's all kinds of things you type. 99.99% of the things that you would type, it's like, I have no idea what this is. 
And so you play this game where you're trying to figure out, well, all right, what can this thing actually understand, which doesn't feel very natural at all. And that's going to start to change. We've got things like scribble knots. We, like, what's fascinating to me about scribble knots, this thing has, you can type any noun. Like, I think it supports 25,000 nouns. And like, it shows up and you can use it. You type bicycle, a bicycle shows up and you write it around. You type bear, a bear shows up and God shows up and an atomic bomb shows up. And these things all work and function and do what they're supposed to. If God's there and, and you also call up the devil, God starts punching the devil in the face. You know, it's like everything is programmed and intelligent and that's cool. But what's cooler is each time they build a game, they can build on what they've made before. And the vocabulary gets larger and richer. Now I'm gonna, let's talk about Milo. Remember Milo a few years ago? Let's take a look at this and reflect on this. We've been experimenting with something here. I'd like you to meet a boy called Milo. He's a character that can recognize us. He can recognize our faces. He can recognize our voices. He can recognize emotions in us. And this is Claire. She's going to introduce you to Milo. Hi, I'm Milo. How are you doing? Hi, Claire. You OK? Actually, I'm a bit nervous. You? Nervous? I don't believe it. This is the first time that thousands of people are going to see this. Thousands of people? Milo seems a little nervous, too. Um, that may be because he was constructed of vapor and lies. <laughs> right? Now that's right. We, we know that, because otherwise we'd be playing this game, and instead it no, didn't happen. But that's fine. It's... It, what Milo serves as a fascinating vision for us to think about and aspire towards. The ability to have a one-on-one -on -one natural conversation with a character is something we haven't quite gotten to yet, but it seems that within the next 10 years, we should be able to do something like it. And one of the things that's really important about Milo is he, you know, he's, he's got the speech, but he's, he's got something else. He's got something that this guy doesn't have. Mario is a cool character, but he frustrates the hell out of me. Because every time I get a new Mario game and I open it up and I put it in, you know, and it starts out and he says, It's me, Mario! Enter your name! And I'm like, Enter my name! Mario, my God! We've been playing games for 30 years! You don't remember, man? Don't you remember when we met at Vinny's Pizza Parlor? Right? You and me, we took down Donkey Kong. It took like six weeks, but we did it. It was awesome. And you don't remember. You don't know who I am, do you? But like when Claire walks up to Milo, Milo's like, oh, hey, Claire, you know, how's it going? He knows who she is, and he remembers. Right now, we've just gotten to the point where we have persistent databases for each game. Why don't we have persistent databases for each character? When I get a new game, why not have the characters remember what I did in the last game and be able to talk about it and be able to show me videos of the things that happened from last time? That's going to happen, but someone's going to have to make it happen. And that memory is going to be really important. And it's going to happen in all kinds of games, because imagine if every game you played with Mario, he like had this, this ongoing relationship with you, and he remembered all the things you did from all the other games. Now, let's talk about talking to characters. Because mostly when people talk about talking to characters, they assume, oh, we're going to be talking to NPCs. So let's look at that. Actually, here's some talking that happens in Mass Effect 3. Place her in protective isolation. Recommend gentle approach. Krogan slopes trust. I don't need her trust. I'm Commander Shepard, Alliance Navy. Are you here to kill me? Of course not. We're here to take you home. Why? What am I to you? You're the Krogan's last hope. You're the future of the Krogan race. I'm fighting for that. Now notice this relationship. When I heard they were going to have voice in here, I was like, this is going to be dumb. Either I'm going to say it, and the Avatar's going to say it again, which is stupid, or I'm going to say it, and Shepard's just going to stand there, which is stupid. But instead... You say something, and then Shepard follows up with something else. As if, almost as if, we're two different people. We're like a little team. And I say something, and he finishes my sentence, right? And it's like, we're buddies. 
which is a little weird. We've not had that before. Our, well, that's a weird relationship with an avatar. But is it such a weird relationship with an avatar? This is the relationship we've always had. You control an avatar, I'm running him around, and then, oh, cutscene, and he does some stuff, and he's, uh huh, there he goes, all right, all right, and now it's me again. It's him, it's me, it's him, it's me. We shift back and forth. We're comfortable with this, so it's not too surprising when it happens here. So what I'm arguing is, even though everyone imagines that who you're going to talk to in these games are the NPCs, the quest givers, and sure, you're going to talk to them a little bit, but I think the one you're going to talk to the most are going to be your avatar. There's no facility in Mass Effect 3 to have a little chat with Shepard after that character leaves, but like you sure would want to. You know, man, that alien jerk, what the hell was that? And I know, I know, are you kidding me? Right? You'd want to have that conversation. And so I think avatar is going to start to be the wrong word, and I'm envisioning a different word. Virtual companions is the word I start to think of. This character who's there with you, and sometimes you're controlling, and you're working together as a team. Now, when I was a boy, I went on a long drive with my father one time. And it's all quiet in the car. We're just sitting there. And all of a sudden, he says, if you had a friend who was a ghost, how old would you want them to be? And I thought about it, and I said, well, I'm seven, so I think seven, so we could play and stuff. And he said, yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, you're going to get older, and he's not. And I said, oh, oh, yeah, I never thought about that. He said, yeah, that's why you got to think about these things. But it turns out we do have to think about these things, because that's a question. Normally, avatars are made for a certain age, and a game's made for a certain age. And if we change and go away, we're going to lose that character and leave them behind. We're going to want these characters to change with us, change and grow as we change and grow, which will be a huge challenge for us as designers. But damn, if you can do that, that is powerful. That will be very powerful. People may have read Ender's Game. There's an aspect of Ender's Game nobody talks about, which is the fantasy game in there. There's this game that people play. It's like going into a little bit of a dream. You enter this little fantasy world. It's very dreamlike. And the adults in the game call it the mind game or the psychology game because it's designed to kind of help you confront the problems that you have, but like in game form. And the game sort of susses out what problems you have. And there's a quote in here, you know, Ender said, one point says, this game knows me too well, and he can't, he, can't, he can't face what he's dealing with. And imagine being able to create a story that is where you have so much data about the player and what they like and what they're into that you can craft a story that is like just perfect for where they are age-wise and development-wise and interest-wise. That would be really, really powerful. So what platform is all this stuff going to happen on? Everyone wants to know what platform, what platform, where are the story games going to be? What's the right platform for story games? Because I'll tell you right now, all platforms are not created equal when it comes to story. And the right answer is stop thinking about platforms. Platforms are the wrong way to think about the world. You should think about the world instead in terms of venues, right? Where people use things. Because that's going to stay the same. Where people use stuff will not change. It is a rock you can build around. The platforms will change, but the, but the venues won't. So here's the four venues of the home. One of them is the hearth, right? This is the living room where the family gathers to kind of do these sort of public things. The second one is just kind of anywhere, the in-between space. This is where people play mobile games right now. It's a crappy place for stories. There's the reading nook. This is when I want to be really alone and really private and by myself, and it's quiet and it's very quiet, and this is a, obviously a good place for stories. And then a fourth one is the workbench, right? This is where I'm going to go. I've got a thing I want to achieve and accomplish. This is where PC gaming lives. People treat PC gaming differently than these other places because it's workbench mentality. I'm going to do this hard thing, and I'm going to dig in, and I'm going to drill in. It's different than the reading nook. It's different than the hearth. Right? So when people say, we're going, to bring, we're going to bring steam to the living room, really? Is that really what you want to do? No. What you want to do is make an easier way to have steam in the, in the, in the workbench. 
So where's good for stories? No, not anywhere. Anywhere is bad for stories. That's why story games don't work very well on mobile. And the hearth is OK, but not good for story games, because it's boring to watch somebody else's story game. The reading nook and the workbench are the places. What are, their, what are their respective platforms? The reading nook wants tablets, and the workbench wants something like the PC. But what? Will it continue to be the PC? Is the PC going away? I think I'll tell you what's coming. This son of a bitch is coming. <laughs> HMDs are going to come back. And you know what they're good for? They are good for storytelling, because they are incredibly intimate. There's just you and the world, and you are just in there. And there's nobody else in there. I think our rich, I suspect in the next 10 years, our richest story games are going to show up in this medium. And note, this does not belong in the living room. This is a workbench or a reading nook medium. This is not a living room medium. OK, so how do we do? Rich verbs. Well, here in the future, I think it's going to come. If we can talk to characters, suddenly we got above the neck verbs, and it's exciting. How are we doing on the tragedy? Well, I think uh, if you've got a virtual companion who's been with you for 10, 15 years, and something horrible happens to them, and they get killed, or they just get sick of you and they leave because they're fed up with your crap, oh my god. Right, that would be, you would have tragedy in games, and it would be freaking powerful. How about unification, everything coming together? Is technology going to fix this? I'm not so sure about that. That's still a hard, unsolved problem. So does that mean we can? Can we have a Shakespeare of games? And I think that we can, but I think our Shakespeare is not going to be so much a teller of tales, although they will be a teller of tales, but they will be a crafter of characters. Someone will have the understanding of human psychology to make a character that you will bond with and want to stay with and want to have part of your life on all of your platforms, across all of your games, and a companion through life. Think about how when you chose a username when you were, I don't know what, 14 probably, and how you still have it today, and you will probably still have it when you're 65, because that's the way we craft identity. Think about how those little toys that you put on your little cubicle are the same ones you had when you were eight. You're going to have the same virtual companion who goes with you through your whole life. Now, what happens when we die? What are we going to do with these characters? Think about World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft's got 10 years on it. That game's not going anywhere. It's going to be there 20 years, 30 years. What should we do with the characters when the players die? Should we bury them and have a little funeral service? Or maybe, should we pass them on to our descendants? And think about a world where the best way to get to know your ancestors is by inheriting their virtual companions. Because the companions will be able to tell you the stories about everything this person ever did and all the good times they had and everything that happened of your, of your grandfather and great-grandfather because these will get passed down a long, long time. And I know that sounds kind of weird and it sounds kind of sci-fi, but tell me how this will not happen. This is exactly what will and must happen. And who's going to make it? It's going to be us. This stuff's not going to come from Google or wherever. It's going to come from game developers who figure this out and who crack this, because we're there first. Was Siri there first? No. Hey, you, Pikachu, was there first with this stuff. We're going to be out there first, and these game characters are going to weave into our regular lives. And it may well be that we spend a lot of time talking to these virtual companions, because why would you just talk to them in the game? Why not just be like, hey, Mario, what's the weather tomorrow? And he'll tell you all about it, because he's used to talking to you anyway. We may spend more time talking to these virtual characters than we talk to anyone else. And that doesn't sound healthy, <laughs> right? And maybe it's not, and it's one of these things we're going to have to work with and figure out. So while it may have some downsides, I still continue to believe that having some somebody who's there with you and who cares about you and is willing to just be with you all along your journey, no matter what, has to have some value. So I'll end up by leaving you with this. 
Goodbye, Sarah. And remember, fair maiden, should you need us? Yes, should you need us for any reason at all? I need you, Hoggle. You, you do? I don't know why, but every now and again in my life, for no reason at all, I need you, all of you. Oh, you do? Well... Why didn't you say so? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great GDC.